for Anxiety and OCD, episode 49. If you're new to the show, I am your host, Carrie Bach. And today we are talking about the connection between having too much stuff or clutter that invades our lives and how that can cause us anxiety. We have, we can't find things anymore because there's too much stuff in the way, or we have piles around maybe that are crushing our creativity, things that are keeping us from, from doing everything that God has called us to do. So here today with me for a discussion of Christian minimalism is Becca Ehrlich, who is a pastor and Christian minimalist. Thank you for joining me today. Yeah, thanks for having me. This is going to be fun. Yeah. So you once had what some would quote call the American dream, you know, like I have a spacious house and I have lots of stuff in it. And what kind of suffering do you feel like came from at some point having too much stuff? Yeah, I I sort of bought into, pun intended, <laughs> the idea that the reason we exist is to have more, more stuff, more time commitments, more things we use our energy and time for, more recognition, all of that, like more status. And so we bought a 3,000 square foot house. And then when you have, and it was just myself and my husband. And when you have that much space, you fill it with stuff, right? Because it just looks weird to have empty space sometimes, or so we've been told, right? Makes sense. Yeah. So we um, did what normal folks would do in consumer culture and uh, filled it with a bunch of stuff. And then we moved. (laughs) And we moved into a smaller place just because that's what was available at the time where we were moving. And we did not have enough room for all the stuff. So we rented a huge storage unit outside of town and we filled it, they call it high and tight. So it was literally like wall to wall stuff, ceiling to floor stuff. And so like, we couldn't even get into the stuff if we wanted to in that storage unit. And then in our new place, like it was like stuff was coming out of corners and out of closets. And like, it was just stuffed to the gills with all the stuff. It was just not helpful for my life. Like I just, I couldn't find anything. It it was things would fall on top of me. We've all been there, right? You open a closet and it just like (laughs) Mm -hmm. falls down and it was just not good for my well being. I just didn't like it. And so when I discovered minimalism, which by the way, is not just about stuff, right? Our, our, our issue was stuff, but a lot of other people could be other things. We, it made sense to us. And we were like, I think, I think we need to start living a little bit more minimally. How did you discover this and develop this interest in minimalism? Uh, I watched Netflix and my life changed. (laughs) (laughs) Wow. Yeah. No one expects their life to change when they're watching Netflix, but that is what happened. I, um, I have a chronic illness, so I was having a bad health day. And usually when I have a bad health day, I kind of chill on the couch and, and watch, you know, Netflix or whatever. And I was browsing through, I watch a lot, a lot of documentaries and it recommended the minimalism documentary, the original one by the minimalists. And I, um, I'd never heard of minimalism before. I had no idea what it was. And I was like, well, it's only an hour and 15 minutes. So if it's terrible, it's only (laughs) an hour and 15 minutes of my life that I wasted. And it was the opposite. Like I watched it and I said, oh my gosh, I think, I think this is something I need to do. And my husband, Will, got home from running errands. And I was like, you got to watch this. And he was like, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> he eventually sat down with me and we watched it together. And we said, you know what? I, th- I think this is something we need to do. Mm, that's good. You definitely have to get your spouse on board if you're married and are going to do this for sure, I think. Yeah, I will say, though, that like both of us have very different ways. We live out minimalism, which I think is also okay. So you don't necessarily okay. have to be completely on the same page and agree with all the things. You just have to like be okay with each other <laughs> living mm-hmm. out a more simple life. <laughs> so you said that it's not just about the stuff. Can you tell us about some of the other aspects of minimalism? Yeah. So basically minimalism is a focus on the aspects of life that matter most and intentionally removing everything else. So at its core, it's living intentionally and getting rid of anything that's 
keeping you from focusing on what's most important. So that can be anything, right? Like for a lot of people, it's stuff because that's just how consumer culture works. We've accumulated too much stuff. But for other people, it could be time commitments. Like maybe you said yes to all the things out of obligation or because you felt like you had to or were expected to or whatever. Um, it could be chasing uh, wealth and status and fame. That's also something that's uh, glamorized <laughs> in consumer culture. So um, it's paring down your life to be more intentional and focus on the most important things like relationships and self-care and uh, passion and things like that. It's interesting that you say that about not chasing fame and fortune. I just had a conversation with another entrepreneur this morning that we just get together and have business chats. She told me, you know, everybody's trying to chase this six to seven figure thing. She's like, I just don't need all that. You know, I just, I mean, I need a few thousand dollars to pay my bills and and live okay. You know, she's like, what do I need to make six figures for? That's just not what's important to me. And so that's kind of exactly what you're saying, like finding what's really important and really valuable. And this individual also has a daughter. So obviously it's important for her to have time to spend with her daughter and to have self-care and have enough rest. So do you feel like having the chronic illness or receiving that diagnosis affected this? Oh, yeah. I think for folks who don't have an infinite amount of energy and health, <laughs> and that's everybody really, but especially folks who are living with illness, living more simply and more minimally just makes the most sense because you're just more intentional about what you're using your time and energy for. So it was a no brainer for me as someone with chronic illness, because I just have to be more intentional about how I'm using my time and energy throughout the day. Because if I don't, by the end of the day, I'm just going to be dead meat. And maybe the next day I'm going to be dead meat. Yes. It's interesting because my husband, I got married last year in October and my husband calls me a minimalist, which I find kind of funny because I wouldn't necessarily put that label on myself, but he really sees how I interact with stuff specifically for buying. Like I may see something and say, oh, that's, you know, cool or something. But I really don't have space for that extra gadget in my kitchen. I mean, where would I put that? Or, you know, I just don't know that I would really use that a whole lot. Or I just don't need that. You know, you think about how many people have invested in multiple kitchen appliances that don't don't pull them out of the cabinet or don't use them and I I watched the documentary like you did as well and it really made me and I actually the minimalists have a podcast I've listened to some of their podcast episodes as well and I appreciate some of their values that they repeat a lot like using things not people the memories are not in the stuff like they talk about you know not having to hold on to every family heirloom that you have because your memories are with your relatives so even though i don't think that they say anything specifically about their faith i do believe that some of those values can be translated over um and align with with christian values and i imagine that you you found that same thing and and that was how you started like writing on your blog yeah, at the time. So when I discovered minimalism, it was the end of 2017. So there, there really wasn't like I researched it afterwards because I was like, oh, they talk, the minimalists talk a lot about meaning. And so the implication being you'll be able to find more meaning in your life when you're living more simply and focusing on what's most important, which makes sense. And I was like, oh, that's really interesting because usually meaning is something that you find through religious tradition. And for me as a Christian, I found that a lot of what they were talking about aligns very well with Jesus's teachings and what's in scripture. And so I was like, I want to read more in depth about this. And at the time, there really wasn't anything out there. There was a couple articles or blog posts or maybe a YouTube video here and there, but there was nothing in great depth. And that's so that's why I ended up writing about it. Cause I was like, okay, well, I can't be the only one that's interested in this intersection between the Christian faith and minimalism and I wasn't, which is great, <laughs> but it's really interesting because like when you write, you really discover things about yourself while you're writing. It's like, you know, that's why people journal and things like that. So the blog has really helped me discover things about why I accumulated stuff in the first place and, and why I say yes to things when I really shouldn't and really helped me get at the core reasons why I, I do those things that are not serving me well. And that's helped me live more minimally. 
Yeah. Talk with us a little bit about that, like putting the pause button on getting new things, because everyone can go through their stuff or their closet and be like, yeah, I don't need this. I'm getting rid of it. Going to give it away, whatnot, put it in the garage sale. But then next thing you know, six months later, they're back in the same place with too much stuff. So I'm curious, like what that process was like for you, like in terms of your evaluation of, of buying things or having to approach things differently. Yeah. One of the big things for me, and this is what I always tell people is that you have to find your why your reason for Uh. to live more simply, because if you don't do that and it's just, so like the decluttering movement, for example, is super trendy right now. Mm -hmm. Basically it's just about getting rid of stuff, um, which in itself is not bad, but like, like you said, it's not going to last if you don't get at the core reason why you want to simplify in the first place, because you're just going to accumulate back the things that you got rid of eventually. So finding your personal why, like for me, it was spending more time with friends and family. It could be other things for other people. Maybe you want to go back to school or whatever. You know, there's, there's a wide range of whys you want to do this, but find your why. And that will also help keep you motivated because it's not super glamorous to minimize. It sounds cool. And you get halfway through and you're like, oh my gosh, I'm going to die. <laughs> this is a lot of work. <laughs> I appreciate the transparency there. That's good. Yeah. Like it, you, everybody hits a wall at some point because it's just, it's work. And it's going, a lot of times it's going counterculturally and it's going against what, how you lived previously. So it's, it's a, not only like physical work, but it's also mental, emotional, spiritual work because you're literally shifting your worldview and your lifestyle. So knowing why you're doing it in the first place is going to help you get motivated to continue that process and then live it out, continue living it out. Cause that's the thing, like decluttering is a one and done process. Like you get rid of stuff and you're like, you're done, but like, you're not done. (laughs) Right. No, it's, it's, it's a constant journey. That's why I always call it the Christian minimalism journey, because you're, you're constantly figuring out what adds value to your life and what matters most and, and how you can focus on that because a bachelor or bachelorette is going to live out the minimalist lifestyle differently than someone who's married and has three kids like that's and that's normal so you have to kind of shift depending on your context I think that's great I think it's hard for people with children who may receive a lot of gifts from grandparents aunts and uncles and next thing birthday parties Christmas next thing they know there's just piles of of stuff everywhere and and kids typically do not want to get on the minimalism board. So it's like if you can ward some of that off ahead of time, it's probably probably helpful, in, you know, encouraging relatives to buy experiences instead of things and different different opportunities for that yeah. time to spend time together, you know. Definitely. And um, the earlier you can start, the better, but it's never too late with kids. Joshua Becker actually has a great book called Clutter Free with Kids. Ah. That kind of outlines a lot of this for younger to older kids, which I think is great. So I think there's ways that like younger children and teenagers do actually want a more simple lifestyle. They just are so used to the consumer culture around them that it may be um, a little bit of shift for them, (laughs) just like it is for us. Right. But I think I think it's definitely something that can be incorporated with kids. Mm hmm. For you, what does being a minimalist look like on a on a practical day-to-day level? Yeah, intentional living, which sounds kind of cliche, but I'm like literally aware of how I'm making decisions around consumption and spending and cons- money habits and ways I use my time and energy and resources. Like I'm just very much aware of how I do that and how I make decisions around that and how I make those decisions has completely shifted since becoming a minimalist. It's not that I don't spend money and I don't own things. <laughs> I think I think some people hear you're minimalist and it's like they picture this like room with one chair and that's it, you know? <laughs> right, no pictures on the wall. And... Right. right, like obviously I own stuff. I have pictures on the wall. I'm currently packing to move. So I own things, but I own less things because I'm much more intentional with what I bring into my life. And that includes all things. That includes things, that includes people, that includes time commitments, that includes media usage. I'm just very intentional with how I use all of that. And so for me, it's, it's a good productive day for me if I've been intentional and I made some time for rest and renewal as well. 
That's good. Did you used to have a lot busier schedule and just kind of say yes to all the opportunities and pile them on? Yeah, a hundred percent. Like I was like, I was one of those I'll rest when I'm dead type people. Uh, And it was not good for me. I mean, I felt awful all the time. I was exhausted. I felt burnt out. I just wanted to like disappear on a desert island and not (laughs) talk to people again. (laughs) And that's not normal. We shouldn't feel like that. (laughs) Right. Right. Uh, uh. So much goodness there in terms of rest and Jesus getting away to reflect, spend time with God. And really, if you look at the life of Jesus, he was very intentional about how he spent his time, who he spent his time with. I always find it interesting that in one of the early chapters of Mark, where people were coming to be healed and they were trying to get to Jesus and Jesus like up and left. (laughs) And we look at that and we're like, that doesn't seem right, you know, but it was just he couldn't do everything in his humanity. Like he couldn't meet with every single person, you know, he would have been there for for years and years just doing that. He could have set up a little hut and just had people come to him, but that wasn't the mission. So he had to get out and be on be on the move. And I I look at that and I think, you know, a lot of times we try to help everybody with everything. And we think that that's like a Christian thing. Like, oh, well, I've got to do all these good things for other people. But the reality is we need to be intentional to like our calling and what God has asked us to do globally as Christians, but also specifically. And if we miss that because we're looking at every single opportunity to help people, then we're missing the boat there. Yep. And I think um, especially like church going folks tend to be like over overextended. Um, yes. Like, and I don't know why that's a thing in Christian culture, but it totally is. And that's, that's not even what Jesus did. <laughs> not even what God did when God created the world. Like God, right. God rested yeah. when God created the world. So like, obviously we're not built, like God gave us the Sabbath as a gift to rest and connect with God and our loved ones. And like, so we aren't even created to, to keep going 24 seven all the time. Like we're not made to do that. And so if we do that, we're not, it's not going to go well for us. Um, and I learned that the hard way. Um, and especially with my chronic illness, like that's not even doable for me. (laughs) So making sure that there's built in time for rest and renewal, even when it's a busy time, obviously we go through spurts where it's busier than others. And so making sure that you build in that time, so you're not getting burned out. Sure. So we talked a little bit about some small steps that people can take to get started. And you talked about really even, I think, before getting rid of stuff, like finding your why. Why do you want to live more simply or more minimalistic? Looking at what maybe what domains need to change. Is it about the stuff? Is it about how I'm spending my time? Am I overextended Is it financially? And then what are maybe some other small steps that you feel like people can take if they're just really beginning this journey? Yeah, I always encourage people to start small. I think it can be very overwhelming. Like if your problem is stuff and you're looking at a whole house filled with stuff, obviously you're never going to get started if you're like, oh my gosh, I have a whole house full of stuff. (laughs) You get this Mm. like paralysis looking at all the things you need to do. So for us, it was stuff for us. We started a drawer a day. It was literally 10 to 15 minutes a day and it was easy and it was quick and you could see results really quickly and it helped uh, motivate us to continue more because you could see tangible results. And then when we had more time on our hands, like a Saturday, we, um, we like tackled that storage unit I talked about before. It took many Saturdays, but (laughs) yes, but finding ways to set aside time to do it. And even if it's just five, 10 minutes a day, just start small. Like if it's your social media usage, for example, I've had some people start there and being like, okay, I'm going to let myself scroll through social media for a half hour tonight and then I'm done. And just being more intentional with that because we've all been there where we're scrolling through and it's been like an hour (laughs) and you're like, where did that hour go? And then you've lost an hour. You're never getting that hour back. And it's probably not the best use of time. It might be if you found some cool stuff, but it's still an hour out of your life. Just finding ways to be intentional and start small. Yes, that's good. So we were talking about in, you know, when I intro the episode that oftentimes having a lot of stuff can lead to anxiety. 
have you seen in terms of other people that you've interacted with or yourself personally, like an, a reduction in anxiety from reducing the amount of stuff or living more intentionally? Oh, definitely. Yeah. I have a lot of folks who either have anxiety disorders that are diagnosed or, or feel anxious regularly. And once they cleared their space, whether that be physical, mental, emotional, social, they find that they have breathing space basically. And the anxiety has lessened a little bit. Obviously, if you're diagnosed with an anxiety disorder, um, it takes a lot more than that, but sure. um, it can at least help the process of finding ways to handle that anxiety. I know that for me, I, I feel a lot less anxious when I, when I don't have as much stuff or clutter in my, in my brain or around me. It's, and it's actually, they've done some studies around this to show that um, when there's less clutter, people, people feel less anxious and less stressed. And so finding ways to make that space for yourself is really important. I find that true of my office in my, now I have a home office and if it's got a lot of paperwork stacked up or things that I've put to the side and haven't dealt with, I just notice that I feel more cramped in there, less free. I find myself trying to work in other areas of the house instead of being in the office, which is where I need to be in. So I can definitely attest that that's, that's true for me. And obviously, I think what we're talking about here as well, we're not necessarily diving into like hoarding or anything of that nature, which is something that's more extreme. We're just talking about the normal day-to-day -day American westernized um, way of living, unfortunately, that we often so easily, because it's all around us in our culture, just kind of fall into and we don't even realize how it's affecting us until we get to a certain point. And actually, the typical American house on average has 300,000 things. Wow. Isn't that a lot insane? of things? It's insane. <laughs> yeah. Wow. I did not know that. I know for me, I've gone through different seasons and periods of my life where, you know, I had foster children and I had this kid stuff around. And then, you know, you wouldn't know what ages of children you were going to get. So I had these different toys and clothes in the attic. And, uh, then I went through a divorce and then I got remarried. My husband moved in. So, it's interesting now we're in kind of a uh, a similar season where we're trying to decide what's most important. And I'm trying to be sensitive to his stuff and not just say like, ah, we don't really need that. <laughs> so I'm curious for you, maybe you could talk a little bit about relationally in terms of working with this with your husband. Like, how have you two been able to come together to achieve the common goal? Did you have certain criteria for things as you were looking through them or? Yeah, that's a great question. And I always tell people, it's funny you bring that up because I always tell people do not minimize another person you're living with stuff because it doesn't end well. Right. <laughs> <laughs> never, never ends well. Let them deal with their own stuff. So I always uh, encourage people. And this is something that, that we did is we, we dealt with our own stuff because obviously we were dealing with stuff first and our own time commitments. Obviously time commitments, when we have them together, we have to have those conversations. If it's stuff that we both use, obviously we talk through it and see if it adds value to, to our lives and if we want to keep it in our lives. Um, but keeping communication open is really key. And that's for anyone you're living with, right? So like it could be any family member, it could be a roommate, especially if like I've had friends who started the minimalist lifestyle and live with, with roommates and, uh, and their roommates are not minimalist. And so <laughs> right. finding ways to, okay, well, my own space is going to be my own space, but then also like trying to find ways to live in this way in communal spaces where other folks may not be living the same lifestyle as me. So just finding ways to do that. And what we've actually seen is that a lot of times when people start living more minimally, other people see the benefits and then they start doing it after the fact. So even if the folks you're living with aren't on board right away, they may be later. So just do what you're doing and they may see for themselves that it's worth it. That's good. That's good. We had a yard sale recently from just combining two households of, of two adults. And obviously we couldn't keep everything and we redecorated the house. I, I got let go of my office office and just have my home office. So that was definitely a big downsize. 
And it was interesting to see my husband go through this process because I think he struggles a little bit more maybe than I do with getting rid of rid of things. And he said, you know, I really like such and such picture, but it just doesn't fit with the decor of our house anymore. Or I really enjoyed that. And I think maybe somebody else will enjoy that as well. So there, there's something about being able to let things go and bless other people, maybe that can use it more than you can. Yeah, that was a big thing for us. Um, so we have a son who died and we uh, moved a couple times with all the baby stuff because we knew we were planning on adopting at some point probably, but um, we didn't know when. And so we were just holding on to all the stuff. And wow. like we realized after a few years of that, when it was sitting in a storage unit <laughs> that I talked about, like there are families that could use this stuff right now. And we're just collecting dust over here. and so. We donated it all and knowing full well that when we do adopt and we've started the adoption process now that we would most likely have to get it again, but we knew that that was going to be a few years down the road and that we could save up to do that. So we made sure like that's, that helped us let go of it because we knew that there were families that would be using it right now and getting use out of it as opposed to us holding onto it for years and years and years for when we're going to use it eventually. Yes, that was something that I had to help evaluate for myself after, you know, the foster kids left and everything. And I said, well, you know, I have to have my space according to the life I'm living right now, not the future life I hope to have and not, I don't want my house to be full of stuff that's just representative of the past life that I've lived. It has to have this balance of just being present and being in the moment and what does this fit in with the life I'm living right now was a question that I asked myself a lot and it helped me kind of determine which, which stuff needed to stay and which would go. That's fantastic yeah. that you did that naturally because most of the times we hold on to stuff either because it made sense in the past or because we think it might make sense in the future. And like in reality, most of those in future things don't actually happen in the past. It, it doesn't, it's not serving us now. So being like, okay, is this serving me now? Is this adding value to my life right now? And if it's not, if it's past the future, it's, it's okay to get rid of it. Right. The whole, I might need this one day mindset. Yeah. And like that, that just in case thing, like never ends up happening like 99% of the time. Right. <laughs> right. So as we're getting towards the end of the podcast, I like every, to ask every guest to share a story of hope, which is a time in which you received hope from God or another person. Yeah. So, so I went on a three week retreat to Costa Rica, which uh, was not a Christian retreat. It was, it was an alternative wellness retreat, which was a whole new experience for me. I had not really dealt with uh, the grief around not really being able to have biological children. So my chronic illness, I have mast cell activation syndrome. It's um, genetic. So it's past it's 50, 50 shot that'll get passed on if I were to have a biological and try to have another biological child again, and it's more severe every time it's passed on. So I could in all consciousness, like give birth to a child that would be disabled for life. So I don't feel comfortable doing that personally. So we had felt called my husband and I to adopt at some point anyway. It's just, we're just adopting now. Um, That's awesome. Yeah. But I didn't feel, I wasn't ready to let go of the fact that I wasn't going to have biological children. And in Christian circles, there's a lot of weird baggage around uh, women and childbirth and yes, of weird stuff around that, that I had to work through. And I hadn't, I just kind of stuffed it down and not dealt with it. And so when this opportunity arose to go on this retreat, I said, okay. And I did it and I came out of it and I was ready to adopt. Like I had worked through all that stuff, which was really cool. You can actually watch this retreat and my experience it was filmed <laughs> wow okay yeah it's called lost resort it was filmed um it was originally aired on tbs network so you can watch it on demand there but now it's also streaming on hbo max if anyone is interested in watching that but that gave me so much more hope because i just wasn't ready to take the next step to adopt and now like we, we've already started the process we're really excited we did all the educational classes and we just really excited to see what what child God wants us to parent. So that's great. That's great. Yeah, it's like 
we have to be able to allow God to fully close one door so that we can be ready to receive and open that next door. I'm glad that you were able to just receive from God on that and be able to fully process through those emotions, which I'm sure were pretty big. Yeah. And like, it it was interesting for me because I think there's this mentality sometimes in Christian circles that like something needs to be Christian in order for it to, that in order for God to work through it. And in reality, like God can work through, like God's God. (laughs) Right. Yes. Yes. Pretty much anything. And so like, I, even though the retreat I went to wasn't necessarily Christian and like it had, um, you know, indigenous culture practices in it, like God worked through that so that I could then be ready to adopt. So I think finding ways to listen for God in, in places that you wouldn't necessarily expect. Yes. That's a good point to bring up. I'm glad that you, you talked about that because God works in all kinds of different ways through different people and even people that don't know him necessarily. Well, thank you for giving us the a gift of your time today. And I've really enjoyed having this conversation and I know it's going to be a positive impact on so many of our listeners. Great. Well, thanks so much for having me. And I hope everyone is able to live a little bit more simply. <laughs> hope for Anxiety and OCD is a production of By the Well Counseling in Smyrna, Tennessee. Our original music is by Brandon Until next time, may you be comforted by God's great love for you.